first of all, thank you all for, for being here. And thank you to Julie and Rethink and Adrian and all the great people at LinkedIn for putting on this amazing event. Um, so my name is Frank Yu. And to introduce myself, I wanted to share two uh, random things from my past, two random things from the present. And this is something that we do at, uh, at Lyft on the design team to onboard new, new hires. And I thought it'd be fun to, to give it a try here and, and uh, see how it goes. So hopefully um, you're, you're cool with that. Um, and by the way, none of this has anything to do at all with collaboration. So just to set, properly set expectations. Uh, but you know, I want you to know me. <laughs> Starting with the past. So I moved around a bit as an adult. Uh, I would intentionally like uproot myself, try new things, such as working at a mafia restaurant, waiting tables uh, in Rhode Island, and that is mafia owned, not mafia themed. Uh, <laughs> and so despite the, the cheeky gifts here, I never experienced any violence. They were all very, very nice to me. As you can see, my <laughs> kneecaps are intact, uh, unbroken. I also experienced the spectacle of collegiate sports in Ann Arbor, Michigan. So I worked and lived there for a bit. And football is very big out there, if you, if you know anything about the Big Ten. Um, so it was fun to kind of get all swept up in the, the rah-rah fandom there. Um, and an interesting fact for you, uh, the University of Football uh, the University of Michigan football stadium is actually the largest stadium by capacity in the United States, second in the world. My first design job was creating illustrations and animations for a lottery tech company in Rhode Island. A little weird, but it was a legit design job. <laughs> and therefore, my earliest design heroes were masters of new media and motion graphics. So I was heavily influenced by designers like Paula Scher, the late Hillman Curtis, who I actually got to meet when I was a designer at Yahoo, and Joshua Davis. On to the present. Currently, I am a director of design at Lyft, where I focus on core passenger and an autonomous experiences, as well as enterprise solutions and other emerging use cases. And my family is like my oxygen. I'm actually on paternity leave right now, which is awesome. I'm loving it. Uh, but dang it, it is really hard work. Uh, so to all the parents, if you're out there, I salute you. If I see you afterwards, please teach me your ways. <laughs> OK, so today we're here to talk about collaboration. Um, have you ever looked it up, uh, the definition? I mean, not that you'd actually need to, but I did. <laughs> um, mainly for shits and giggles, but I was genuinely curious about like, what is the official definition? So this is what came up. To work jointly with others, particularly, especially in an intellectual endeavor, which is pretty standard, maybe a little boring. But then definition number two kind of like turns it up. Uh, and jumps to traitorous co cooperation <laughs> with an enemy. I'm like, geez, that's a little aggressive. Um, and then finally, the third definition is, says it kind of finds this happy middle, right? To cooperate with an agency or instrumentality, let's call it other teams for our purposes here, with which one is not immediately connected. And so this one, to me anyway, sounds about right for today's discussion, yeah? So, we know what it means, and we all do the act in some form, but I think what's interesting is all the particulars and style and how each one of us applies it to the work and our teams. Um, so today, I wanted to share a few personal stories and key lessons from the trenches and describe how collaboration has evolved and morphed through different stages of growth at Lyft. So starting with the early days, and then on to the transitional years that followed, and then a few words on our more recent focus um, uh, to round it out. Um, and by the way, this isn't meant to paint a picture of what's necessarily right or, or what's necessarily wrong, uh, but it's rather my observations um, as, a, as a primary stakeholder at Lyft. So I hope at least some of it will resonate with you guys here today. All right, so starting with the, the early days. In the early days at Lyft, the product team was very small. Two co-founders, maybe six engineers, 
one and a half designers, a half of a PM, and I'm the one who represented the two halves of both of those last two roles. Um, and then everyone in those days, we just sat next to everybody. So we'd conduct meetings, we'd make decisions, we'd all get our work done. Uh, John, our co-founder here, could knock out on-camera interviews, and this would all happen within the confines of our sweaty little bullpen. <laughs> Um, and so this was all very common week to week. And at that intimate scale, collaboration is just kind of baked into how the team works. So our structure was very simple. It was flat. Organizational friction was virtually non-existent. And communication was very streamlined. I could just turn to one of my teammates, as I'm doing here, um, ask a question, answer a question, and we'd be on to the next thing. So we didn't have newfangled tools like Slack. You know, everything was just out in the open and transparency was just a standard operating theme for us at the time. And there was no strict process uh, or rigorous project management. You know, for daily sprints, we tracked progress on these analog sprint boards that we made with painter's tape and stickies on the walls and the glass, so it was all super low tech. Um, but we were one team, we were all focused on the same mission, we were all working on all aspects of the product, and it was energizing, and it was actually efficient, you know, if not maybe a little bit chaotic at times. And this simple operating environment is what I believe actually enabled us to, sh to build and ship the V1 of Lyft in a matter of three weeks. So in three weeks, we designed, we built, we shipped the passenger app, the driver app, and the backend operations dashboard. And it was crazy. It was a crazy, super ambitious challenge, but somehow we pulled it off, and it was actually pretty fun. The project was actually born from a hackathon project uh, where the intent was to generate new ideas on top of our core competency of peer-to-peer -peer transportation. Um, and the winning direction then led to further you know, explorations, more brainstorms, whiteboard sessions where we landed on the peer-to-peer -peer model um, for the on-demand use case. Also, because we were so small and nimble, we could be incredibly responsive and 100% focused on execution. No politics, distractions were kept to a very bare minimum. So all fired up, we were excited to experiment um, and to some degree, even prepared to fail. And oddly enough, that gives you kind of a healthy jolt of confidence, right? You feel empowered. You feel emboldened to take big bets and, and take risks. Um, and it's that optimism, that positive energy that be actually become the building blocks of your culture. And so to me, uh, a big part of the magic of being a part of this, this rocket ship was those times in the beginning. So what did I learn? Having a shared mission and a tight culture helped the team actually stay on task. Uh, it helps you roll with the ambiguity and the frequent pivots. Small teams require less process uh, and less operational overhead. So this is really great for productivity. You know, you're really optimized for doing and reacting maybe less optimized for deep analysis or thorough planning. And while excitement and productivity are at an all-time high, we also had to get accustomed to frequent fire drills, you know, always being ready to address bugs and critical gaps uh, and go after new opportunities. So this could be pretty comfortable, but at this scale and at this stage, um, thrash is pretty typical. So, which brings me to the transitional years. So in 2012, during the early days, uh, we had one product team. By 2014, our product was maturing, uh, our team was growing, we had a lot more people, uh, we're covering many more cities by, by this time, and so this is all happening very, very rapidly. Plus, our executive team was getting a big injection of new blood. Um, new blood and people that have a lot much deeper experience. So by the summer of 2015, we had hired nine senior execs, seven of which had joined just within the span of a year. 
So as you can imagine, with new leadership comes new people, new teams, new strategies. Um, and there was also a swelling and sort of intensifying energy, right? And then this new, uh, this new jolt of a new sense of urgency. And so for sure, during this time, things were very dynamic. Yet, while much of the company was growing like crazy, design remained relatively small. And so to give you a sense of our scale at the time, um, our designer to engineering ratio was about one to 17. So it was typical that designers are working across multiple projects on multiple, across multiple teams. So in terms of proximity, you know, where we sat, designers huddled together. And it wasn't just for, for warmth and safety, uh, again, because of our relative size, it actually made sense. You know, we didn't want to have these one or two person islands lost in a sea of engineering and product. And that's not to say we didn't love our product managers and our engineering partners, because um, that's, that was, of course we did. Um, but we didn't want to lose our ability to maintain like a holistic experience for our passengers and our drivers. From a collaboration perspective, as a design team, we became very tight-knit and very culturally strong. And with the design team be, all being like super in tune with each other, uh, as we're working across many different areas of the product, we felt that we were in a better position to maintain that holistic oversight. And we felt accountable to it. So we couldn't have our product looking like the company org chart, right? So in terms of cross-functional collaboration, we resourced projects based on relative priority from like a master roadmap. It was like agency style, like a consultant. Um, we simply did not have the bandwidth or the scale to have dedicated designers for each one of our product teams. So unfortunately, what that meant was we had to make difficult trade-offs every quarter. And we had to say no more often than we would have liked to. Um, and because of that, design was starting to become a little bit of a bottleneck. So we increased investment in the design team. We grew from six to 15, and we kept growing into the 20s with the intent to cover more product areas. And so we spun up new design pods, we added research, new specialty skills, and we also doubled down on the agency model with all of us sitting together in a beautiful, dedicated design space. And our design studio was built with all the functional tooling you know, to help us streamline how we work, our internal operations. Um, and the idea, too, was also to help step change the quality of the work that was coming from our team. And we also invested, in addition to that, in team behaviors. You know, we wanted to introduce a little bit more rigor into our design practice. So tighter process, greater ownership, um, paying more attention to the craft and the ritual of making things beautiful, making things with a lot more intention. And the work here led to the innovation of a lot of our zero to one uh, projects, you know, like our autonomous user experience, new cuts on our core passenger and driver experiences, um, and the genesis of several emerging use cases. So it actually was an exciting um, and important time for us on the design team. But there's a but. Um, it became clear over time that we had perhaps over-indexed on internal investment and internal process. And while we were doing better work, more inspired work, uh, and in many cases even creating trajectory for the company, not enough of it was getting outside the studio and into our users' hands. So our operational model as a design team had become a bit of a drag on product throughput. Um, and the feedback that we were hearing, at least on a few different sides, was that communication uh, and collaboration between design and other functions might have actually regressed. So we grew up a lot. Uh, and learned a lot through those transitional years. Um, while we strengthened team process uh, and rigor around the design work, our cross-functional relationships uh, got less attention and therefore experienced some atrophy. 
Isolation and losing touch with other parts of the organization can lead to productivity loss. Uh, productivity loss can then lead to downstream issues with communication and culture and on the ground politics. I also learned that broad operational shifts, they rarely happen proactively, you know, in anticipation of any friction. In fact, they usually change because of some reaction to it. So we really had to pay attention to the leading indicators. And what's important here is that we acknowledge them, right? We acknowledge them and we change tack going forward. And that's what I'll talk about next. So now for a quick look at our recent focus on productivity and alignment specifically. A new hope, if you will. <laughs> so the design team has recently made a big page turn from a partnership and operations standpoint. So at a high level, again, the themes we're stressing are productivity, cross-functional alignment, and shared impact. And we're also growing aggressively. We still have to be able to solve for scale and coverage, so that remains a top priority for us. You know, we have to find the best people, make sure every team has the right resources to operate at a high level, and also do incredible work. And in addition to scale, we think functional matchups enable true partnership. So ideally, we'd like every design team member to be in every strategic conversation with their product and engineering peers, um, which is actually exceedingly difficult when an individual is kind of peanut buttered across multiple teams, um, as it is in the agency model. So, you find yourself having to choose which planning meetings to go to, which, which product reviews to attend, right? Um, which offsites and which standups can I actually commit to? So in the new model, we're aiming to eliminate these trade-offs. So theoretically, by being consistently present and available, you'll have real strategic skin in the game. Plus, you won't be dropping in with just the partial context. No, you'll have the full context you'll have complete alignment on vision, complete alignment on strategy, uh, and shared accountability of the results. And ideally, this should be happening all of the time. So this, in a way, brings us back to that, that one team, one mission mindset of the early days. Uh, and we happen to be at a scale now where we can also co-locate with our cross-functional partners and avoid that lonely island effect. And so where that's happening, um, these teams are building new bridges, uh, new bridges with their product and engineering partners. Trust seems to be growing a little bit stronger. And we're seeing the right shifts towards alignment, which is really um, encouraging to see. Uh, so again, it's early. We're still learning. But so far, I think it's feeling pretty good. So at our current scale, what am I learning? I've learned not to hold sacred the status quo. Um, you gotta listen, listen to your partners, um, establish share, shared goals, uh, strive to operate as one team uh, versus a collection of functions and a collection of factions. Understanding that we're all stakeholders in the company and how the business is run. So we believe no one team owns the experience or the strategy or the results. We should all feel accountable to the outcomes. And anyone, everyone, I should say, should play, should be playing an active role in shaping not just the work itself, but how the work is done. Finally, as we optimize for alignment within product teams, we'll need to work even harder to ensure consistency in the experiences that our teams are building. So um, the work is not nearly done. So in closing, let's summarize. Early days, if you happen to find yourself here, establish a shared mission, start building positive, healthy team culture, enjoy the smallness, uh, take advantage of the benefits of you know, minimal process, because it'll probably never happen again, um, having low operational overhead and greater speed. And then you know, expect some of that thrash and whiplash. Um, it's, in a way, it's kind of part of the excitement at this stage. If you're in the transitional years at a really fast growth startup, invest in your team, absolutely. 
embrace scale for sure, but don't ignore your cross-functional relationships. Um, as you grow, resist the pull to isolate yourself and your team. Um, you actually have to proactively you know, build and exercise these muscles of transparency and partnership and be constantly reaching across the aisle. And pay attention. Pay attention to like the leading indicators of uh, collaboration and operational choke points. Um, and actually be prepared to address them when they come up because I guarantee you they are going to happen. If you're at a larger scale uh, and you're firmly planted on that rocket ship, um, try to avoid process and operational religion, uh, even within your, your focused area of the product. Um, and try to achieve a skill that will allow you to show up um, as a true partner for your cross-functional team. Be engaged in all aspects of your product area. Strive to operate as one team. Um, and yes, be a functional expert, but try not to hold too tight to functional ownership. And then finally, you have to create additional touch points to help balance you know, do the domain expertise and operational productivity with product excellence. And finally, here are a few things that I consider um, to, be, to matter at any stage of the game. Understand what drives your company like operationally. And what I mean by that is like understand, is your company product driven? Or is it a technology driven company? Um, or, you, or are you customer experience and design driven or some combination? Um, and I'm not saying one is any better than the other, but knowing where you stand will help leverage synergies versus burning energy and kind of fighting a constant operational tide. Be crystal clear on company priorities and prioritize your team behaviors and your team's work streams around the things that will best support your customers and your business at any given moment. Um, and my final point, um, I think we all realize, and I think this is why we're having this conversation here, is uh, achieving operational excellence at scale is like incredibly difficult. Um, in particular, when the ground beneath you is constantly shifting. Um, but I believe you, you can manage uh, if you stay flexible, uh, if you're open to feedback, um, and you embrace change. And I emphasize change because, after all, I think it's inevitable. Um, and in my experience, it's unending. It's, in, it's incessant. Uh, so you've got to stay on your toes, um, stay engaged in the process, and, and just be ready for it when it shows up. Um, so that's my time. And as DJ Khaled might say, I appreciate you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you.